And you just had a completion assignment due. That was what my told to do today. On Friday, you're going to have two things due. You're going to have a completion assignment again. Do at least seven of the 11 problems that you see from section 1.2 right here. I highlight these very so that'll be a completion assignment, but there will also be a graded assignment that you can work in gr uh, groups of two to three people or by yourself if you want. 1.2, number 39. It's an example of something called a mixing problem. Uh, hopefully we'll have time to do a mixing problem at the end of the class today. I also have, I found a video on YouTube, not done by me, done by somebody else, about a mixing problem that you can use to help you do that graded problem. Though I'm actually giving you the key for this one, okay? I'm not usually going to give you the key, but I am going to give you the key for this one. You should, again, do your very best to um, do it without looking at the key. You again want to write sentences. And if you're you know, looking for guidance about how to write your sentences, you can look at my key again and see how I wrote my sentences. <clears throat> Equations can go within sentences. But I want that sentence structure there to get full credit. And the explanation should be good, too. All right? You should really say what you are doing. Uh, make sure when you turn in the graded and the regular homework that you put them in separate spots in the slot outside my office. And let's go alphabetical order. Top slot outside my office, put completion on the left and graded on the right. And make sure everybody's name is on the graded. There's also a Mathematica assignment, not due until next Tuesday at 2 p.m. to turn in electronically. Compared to the multivariate book calculus Mathematica homework, these are a lot longer, but there's only going to be two of them the whole semester instead of about 10. Okay, one's going to be due next Tuesday, an off day, to give you a little more flexibility with your Monday, Wednesday, Friday assignments. The second one's going to be due to the Tuesday after that. If you haven't taken a look at these things yet, you should do it soon, today. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating supplements for the book, Mathematica supplements, and eventually I'm going to make them available to people and maybe sell them online. Um, this first one is a supplement to the very first section on modeling with differential equations. It's a lot of extra stuff, stuff for your own interest, actually. These are links to various things. You, I would suggest not going to a link unless you really, really want to, because it's going to take too much time. But if you really, really want to, you can. I've got links to various subjects here. There's an introduction here. And there is down here, this is my favorite demonstration from the Wolfram Demonstrations Project by somebody named Hiroki Sayama. This is Mathematica code that creates my favorite demo. It's a population model. The bluish dots, actually they're purple on my screen, are rabbits. And the, what color is that on that screen? Reddish, pinkish, orangish dots that look orange on my screen are the foxes. And you can run the simulation to have the foxes chase after and eat the rabbits. <laughs> And you can sit here and wonder, OK, are the rabbits going to get all eaten, or are the foxes going to die off before they eat all the rabbits? Actually, either way, the foxes die off, because if they eat all the rabbits, then they don't have any more food. But you could wonder, do they, do they eventually eat them all? And it kind of depends on the initial conditions. You can reset the initial conditions, and you might get something different. You can change the growth rate of the rabbits, the mobility of the rabbits, the growth rate of the foxes, their mobility. Let's see if it changes anything. Yeah, it looks like rabbits are dominating theirs. Oh, I guess the foxes. There's maybe enough rabbits. Oh, they died. Okay. And then the rabbits keep on living. I was going to say, maybe there's enough rabbits going on there that even though there's just a few foxes and they don't grow very fast, maybe they can still survive. Anyway, so that's, that's a discrete um, predator-prey model, competing, uh, not competing species, but predator-prey. 
my favorite demonstration of the woman pool from demonstration project. So you can enjoy that as hopefully you just did. Maybe watch that as you go to sleep. And then you can open up these sections to read about various things. This thing is about basic differential calculus in Mathematica, which you probably all know about for the most part, except new people. There's a few new people. This is about the exponential growth model, which we'll talk about in class today like we did on Monday. I list the major Mathematica commands used in here. I'm trying to teach you differential equations and, and Mathematica at the same time and, and go beyond the book. That's what I'm doing here. Um, I get into data modeling, which we'll talk about some today, et cetera. You have some exercises to do, one of which is exercise two. All right. What you want to do is you put, you put your answer here. Any, any um, text that you want to type, you put it in the cell. Any Mathematica code that you want to do, you put down below that. I guess it would be good to highlight your Mathematica code in blue as well, just like your text did. Don't change the color, will be highlighted in blue. So you, you're going to be doing some sort of, uh, let's see what we're going to do here. We're going to show the, the function as a solution. You're going to be defining your function like that, for example. And once you've done a bunch of stuff, you can just highlight, select the cells over here, and go up to format, color it in blue. Not everything changes to blue, like that variable stays green, but you see the function turn to blue. So exercise two is one of them that you'll be doing by next Tuesday. There's more exercises to do. I believe the other ones are five, six, seven, and eight, and they're down here further. Here, for example, is exercise seven. Okay, there's five of them to do, uh, and you can work in groups. Don't forget to put your names up at the top, everybody's name. Also, to get full credit, I want you to rename your file with one person's last name at the beginning before you upload it. And I remind you of that in Moodle as well. Okay? So this will take a while, and by the time you're done with it next Tuesday, you'll be into section 1.3 or 1.4. So you'll be on section be beyond section 1.1, but that's okay. You're learning how to use Mathematica for differential equations. The second one is going to be the, due again the week after that, and that's going to be about section 1.2, and when you're working on that, you'll be even further into chapter one. But it's going to be dealing with some pretty important things. I'll talk about these things to some extent in class. Mathematic usage also on Moodle. Stop, there we go. If you go down here, there's there's three classes of videos. There's the videos for in-class time, like is being videotaped right now, okay, which you know you don't need to watch unless you want to, though if you did go back, go back to Mondays, you may have seen that I time stamp it. Um, starting at 1425, for example, you can click on that and jump ahead to 1425 if you want to see my modeling of the population. You can jump ahead to 2330 to see talking about the exponential growth model. And 3545 is to verifying what? Verifying that that function solves the differential equation. Okay, so I'm going to try to make a habit of doing that. Other videos are some instructional videos about mathematical usage for different cues. There's only 10 of these, and they are fairly short 10, 11, 12, 13 minutes. I'm going to maybe make some more of them, but uh, I'm not sure how much time I'll have to make that many more. This will get you with the basics, though, and it shows the mathematical commands used. And finally, uh, the third class of videos is some old videos that I made uh, when this class was taught just online. These were the only video resources that people had. These videos are typically, oops, wrong section. Down there, there we go. Uh, these videos are not on YouTube, actually. They're Kaltura videos within Moodle. Um, and they're more typically 25 to 30 minutes in length, and they're more topical. Okay, but this group is related to chapter one. Okay, so those are optional. Okay, and since you are in class, technically speaking, for you guys, all the videos are optional. It's up to you.
what is there for you if you want. Okay. Any questions? All right. Let's get back to this map here. So we talked about the exponential growth model in class on Monday. <clears throat> and initially I just talked about it without talking about differential equations. I just used an exponential function to model census data. Let's bring that data up here again. This is data from the book. So I should stop that. Here's the census data. 3.9 million people in the U.S. in 1790, 5.3 million people 10 years later in 1800, etc. 281 million in the year 2000. 2010 is not in here. The current year, by the way, for people watching is 2015. I'm making this year. Um, we created this list of points that we could plot with list plot. We also plotted an exponential model on top of that based on using the initial value, the initial population at time zero, 3.9 million. That's the initial condition right there. And we used the population at time 10 in the year 1800 to figure out this coefficient of t in the power of e to be 0 0.03 approximately. At the end, then, we talked about how that's related to differential equations. And we said that that's, that function solved the differential equation. So we kind of went about it backwards. We started with the function, and we wrote down the differential equation itself. Usually, you do it the other way around. You write down the differential equation that you'd like to solve, and then you try to solve it. So in this case, with the exponential growth model, the, the basic hypothesis here is that the rate of change of the population is proportional to the population itself. They get the direction of the proportional to, right? I always forget. Is it like that or is it like this? Or is it like that? Okay, I think I got it right. Alright. Which makes sense. Why does it make sense? I claim it makes sense. Why would this kind of hypothesis about the growth of the population make sense? The more people there are, the more people they're making. The more people they're making, yeah. The more babies, right? Or the more bacteria there there are, the more they reproduce and make baby bacteria, bacterium, bacteria, bacteria. All right. This makes good sense. And what does it mean? This means that. There's some constant, I'll be consistent with the book now and call it K instead of B, K that makes this true for some constant K. Oops. I tend to make my K's cursive. Can you see that okay or do you have to, I have to shift it up? I should try to keep it higher, probably. Probably. Okay. <clears throat> For some constant k, the rate of change of the population, the derivative, the rate of growth, because it's going to be growth, k is going to be positive. That rate of growth is some constant times the population itself. What are we looking for? We're looking for the solution of this. <coughs> the so-called general solution, initially. This is simple enough that you can guess. E to the k times t power works. Its derivative is k times itself because of the chain rule. When you differentiate e to the k times t power, you get k times e to the k times t power. The derivative of this function is k times itself. That's what the differential equation is asking of you to find. 
is a function whose derivative is k times itself. p is the function. Again, we've got this abusive notation kind of thing going on here. Is p a variable or is it the function? Both. Don't let it bother you. Okay? That is not, technically speaking, this is not good. It's sloppy. But we live with the sloppiness sometimes. Sometimes we might prefer giving the function a name other than p, like p will be the most common letter I use. That's not a sloppy. What does it mean for this function to solve that differential equation? It means its derivative, p prime of t, always equals k times phi of t for all t. That's what it means to solve the differential equation. That's true for all t. You don't see a t over there. Okay, it's not written, it should be there in your mind. Although, this is important actually, we don't want to write it there by hand because we want to emphasize this is called an autonomous differential equation and there's a difference between an autonomous and a non-autonomous differential equation. We're not going to write t on the other side. Though it's a little funny when we use Mathematica, we are going to put a t over there, so it's confusing that way. Okay, you got to get used to this kind of stuff, this confusion that happens initially. I will use Mathematica in a bit, but what if we couldn't guess? If we were having a brain freeze, and we couldn't guess that some function like this would work. And by the way, any constant in front of it also works. The derivative of c times e to the kt is k times c times e to the kt. That kind of function works too. Its derivative is k times itself for all t. Can you see what that is? Okay, Alright, but what if, what if you just for some reason were not able to guess that? You can use a method called separation of variables to solve it, at least for this example and some other similarly simple examples. This method is limited, it doesn't always work. You can't always use it is a better way to say that. It always works when you can use it theoretically, though sometimes it's difficult or impossible to actually find the answer still. It works in a theoretical sense rather than in a practical sense. What you, your, your two variables here are t and p, t independent, p dependent. On the left-hand side of the differential equation, there's both a p and a t there. On the right, there's just a p. Yeah, don't write p of t. Just write p. There's just a p over there, no, no t. Get all the p's on one side, get all the t's on the other. It doesn't matter where the k is. The d should stick with its p there and stick with its t there. In effect, okay, there's no pure mathematicians walking by. Wait, wait a minute, I'm a pure mathematician. Okay, well, I'm going to pretend like I'm not a pure mathematician. I'm going to pretend this is a fraction, and I'm going to quote unquote multiply both sides by dt. I always sort of feel a little guilty doing this. But it's okay, okay? It's okay for this kind of thing. It's a method that works, it gets you the right answer, as long as you do the calculations right. It can be justified, but the justification typically tends to be kind of difficult to understand. So, at least right now we're avoiding it. I'm going to get all the p's on the left and all the t's on the right, so I've got to divide both sides by p as well. I've got a dp over p equals k times dt. And when you see that kind of expression, you should start shaking. Or at least your, your writing hand should start sta shaking. Shaking, shaking, shaking. Uh, uh, must integrate. Oh, there we go. That's usually a good thing to do. Maybe not always, but in this class, it's a good thing to do in this situation. Just 
just have this urge to integrate, and so you do. Integrate both sides. What happens when you do so? Well, on the right, it's k times t plus c. I'm going to call it c1, because there's going to be lots of different c's. c1 is an arbitrary constant. Should I write, I guess, natural log of something plus c over there? You don't need the c on the left side. Because if you put arbitrary constants on both sides, then you can, you, know, you can move the one on the left over to the right and get a new arbitrary constant just on the right side. I guess we have a natural log here. Technically speaking of the absolute value of p to get the most general antiderivative, assuming the constant has gone to the other side, you might worry, does the absolute value matter? And usually it doesn't matter. We're going to get rid of it, actually. But initially, let's write it that way. And when you see something like this, you start shaking again. What's going to satisfy your urge this time? E, exponentiate. E and the natural log are inverse functions. You're left with just absolute value of P on the left side. I could write the right side like this. Where C2 is E to the C1. You don't need to bother saying that, although I think in my solution key I did for the first graded problem. And maybe in some completion, completion problems I do as well. <laughs> Technically speaking, C2 would be positive because E to the C1 is going to be positive, even if C1 is negative, right? It's always positive. No imaginary numbers here to deal with. C2 would technically be positive. Uh, but you might say, you might give a pseudo justification that, hey, if I get rid of the absolute value signs on the left, maybe now this C3 is positive or negative. C3 would be plus or minus C2. That's not a full justification. It's just sort of a pseudo justification. And maybe I should call the C3 just a C now, because I'm done. I found the general solution. This function solve the differential equation. We already knew that. No matter what c is. c is an arbitrary constant. The k, however, is not arbitrary. The k there must match the k there. If the k here is 5, the k over there must be 5. The k has got to match the c is arbitrary. That solves this differential equation no matter what c is. But again, the k has to match. What if I add my initial condition and write down an initial value problem, problem in IDP for short, which we typically write <coughs> as a system of two <coughs> equations. dp dt equals k times p. p of 0 equals p sub 0. I could have put a specific number there, like 5. 3.9 million. I will often do this. I will often not write a specific number here and solve the general initial value problem. Though in your homework, usually you get a specific number there. But if I can solve this for an arbitrary but unspecified number, I can certainly solve it for any specific number. And in fact, I could even use my solution for this arbitrary unspecified number, <coughs> excuse me, to help me solve it for any particular number. If I want. You don't have to, but if you want to. Combining these two things, using the initial value that p of 0 equals p sub 0 or p naught. Dr. Greenlee tends to say p naught, I don't remember. p naught is p of 0 is 
c e to the k times zero power, and what's e to the zero power? Don't make the mistake. That's one. C times one. So c is p naught, p zero. And your unique emphasis on the word unique solution to the IDP is P equals P sub zero e to the kt. That is one function. This is an infinite family of functions, infinitely many functions with this equation because of infinitely many values of C. That's not infinitely many functions because I'm thinking of P0 as being some specific number. Therefore, that's a specific number. K is also specific. This is one function. By the way, whether something's a variable or constant is all in your head. Okay, it's all in how you're thinking about it. That's what makes something a variable or constant. How do you want to think about it? I am thinking of C as arbitrary. I'm thinking of P0 as fixed. And that's a unique solution. And generally speaking, initial value problems will have unique solutions, whereas general solutions, general solutions of differential equations will be families of functions, infinitely many functions solve the differential equation typically. All right, let's do a harder example. And I'm going to continue solving these things with some constants involved, like the k. You should have read about the logistic growth model. The book, the authors give you an intuitive argument for why it's a plausible equation. You should read that. I'm not going to take the time to talk about it, at least not right now, because the first example took longer than I wanted. Well, I can sort of quickly say it. When p is small, you imagine that it would make sense for the growth to be exponential. But then as p nears something called the carrying capacity of the environment, like if there's limited food and resources, then you want this rate of change, this derivative, to be getting closer and closer to zero. You want your solution function to look initially exponential, but then level off toward a horizontal asymptote. So you're sort of hypothesizing what you want the graph to look like. And this horizontal asymptote is labeled to be capital P equals capital N. Although we can't use capital N on Mathematica because capital N is reserved for numerical approximations. And it turns out that you want to include that factor there, 1 minus P over N. And if you think about it, now as P gets close to N, P over N is going to get close to 1, and therefore 1 minus P over N is going to get closer to 0. And this derivative is going to get close to 0. In fact, there are two equilibrium solutions constant functions that solve the differential equation. What are they? Equilibrium. Yeah, you read about that. Should have read about that in the book. Zero, zero, P equals zero. P equals zero and P equals N. Those two functions, those two constant functions whose graphs are horizontal lines, both solve the differential equation. Because the derivatives are always zero, they're constant functions making the left-hand side always zero. And they also make the right-hand side always zero when you substitute. Substitute p equals zero, you get zero there. Zero times anything is zero. Substitute p equals n, right there you get zero. Zero times anything is zero. Those two functions corresponding to numbers, zero and n, that make the right-hand side zero, solve the differential equation. They're called equilibrium solutions. That was in section 1.1, brief discussion. How do you solve something like this? It is more complicated. It's a more complicated equation. I'm going to go pretty quickly through it here. So we can hopefully have time for a little Mathematica and 
maybe start a mixing problem. Get all the P's on the left and all the T's on the right. There's only a DT um, as far as something that involves T. This is autonomous. There's no T's on the right. I'm going to divide both sides by P and also divide both sides by 1 minus P over N. What should I do with the K? I find it simplest to leave it on the right, actually. I separated variables. My arm starts shaking. Must integrate. There we go. The right integral is easy to do. KT plus C1. The one on the left, though, is not so easy. What method do you think we should use for the one on the left? It's two word method. PF. Partial fractions. Partial fractions, Daniel. You got it. Anytime you have a constant over a quadratic, well, not any time, but many times, at least if you can factor it like we have here, you want to use partial fractions. But the function we're integrating really is 1 over p times 1 minus p over n. I want to write this as a over p plus b over 1 minus p over n for some a and some b. <clears throat> There's a slightly rigorous way to do this that involves setting up a system of equations in A and B based on matching coefficients. And then there is a less rigorous way of doing this that just involves first multiplying everything by the common denominator there and then substituting values for special values for P that make equations that are very easy to solve. Multiply both sides by P times 1 minus P over N. On the right, well, the left you get complete cancellation. On the right you get A times 1 minus P over N plus B times P. And now here's the slick method. Plug in P equals 0 to see that A equals 1. You see that? If I let P equals 0, that implies the equation becomes 1 equals A. Down low on the board there. Can you get it? Okay. A is 1. What other special value of P do you think I should substitute to find B? N, yeah. Pick the numbers that make these things zero. Which seems not so good, perhaps, because they make these denominators zero and you can't divide by zero. Oh, don't worry about it. Okay, it works. You can check it works by adding the fractions once you plug in the values of A and B. B is going to depend on P, though, I think, here, yeah. Or, excuse me, on N. Plug in, P equals N, get the equation 1 equals A times 1 minus N over N, which is 0, plus B times N, so B equals 1 over N. That's okay. So ultimately, the partial fraction decomposition can be written as 1 over P plus 1 over N over 1 minus P over N. Yikes, fractions within fractions. I can fix that. What should I do to fix that? Maybe I shouldn't fix it. Well, I'll fix it. Multiply the top and the bottom by n. That's the same as multiplying the whole fraction by 1. It's an okay thing to do. If you multiply the top and bottom by n, you will get some cancellation. It'll simplify nicely to that. That is okay to do. Multiplying both the top and the bottom by the same number.
All right, I haven't integrated yet. I've got to integrate this. I'm going to get some logarithms again. I'm going to get natural log of the absolute value of p, careful, minus natural log of the absolute value of n minus p. And that minus sign is essential. Why does it go there? Why is there a minus sign there? General from the negative p. Yeah, I mean, if you differentiate this, when you differentiate that, you'll get 1 over n minus p, but the chain rule will say multiply by an extra factor of negative 1, the derivative of n minus p. In terms of integrating, integrating this, you could think of it as a substitution, u or w, whatever you want to use. u equals n minus p, and then du would be negative dp, and it's constant. you get an extra negative sign in there because of that. So that's the com most common mistake here. In this problem, that minus sign must be there. You get it wrong if it's not. And the right again is just kt plus c1. Can I exponentiate? Is it a good idea here? Yes, it is. Why? Why should it go and be an exponentiate? How are we going to deal with the fact that we've got two logarithms there? To blend them together because there's the minus sign? Yeah. Property of logs. They're always useful. Difference of two logs is the log of the quotient. <coughs> I always feel like you forget that. If you, if you don't have something, some reference handy, and you're not remembering that, you can always try an example. Make the example simple. <coughs> e squared equals e to the fifth divided by e to the third. Should probably should have written that. So if you consider a simple example like that, that'll remind you. That's right. Not a proof. Log uh, difference of two logs is the log of the quotient. Now I can exponentiate. Actually, I could have exponentiated with the difference there and not use the property. But then I need to use a property of exponents. I'd have e to something minus something else. I need to break that up into the product of two e's to two different powers. Yeah, exponentiate. Think of e to the c1 as c2. e and ln cancel out, so to speak. We'll be able to get rid of the absolute value signs, hopefully. Yes, you are. And you can check that it works ultimately. Could I, should I call that c3 just a c now again, like I did before? Uh, I'm not sure. Let's just leave it as C3 here initially, because I might want to change it to a C4 possibly, or a C5, before I change it to eventually to just a C. What do I have left to do there? What, what, what's the goal? Solve for P. Solve for P. We want to find out how P is a function of P. <coughs> Solve that equation for me <coughs> as a function of t. k is fixed. c3 is arbitrary. n is fixed. Lots of letters. Think clearly about what the goal is. Solve for p. Got a technique idea for solving that kind of equation? Multiply the denominator over to the other side? Yeah, multiply both sides by n minus p. Or you can think of that as cross multiplication if you like. You can imagine this is something over 1. OK, more simply, just multiply both sides by n minus p. And on the left, I will also distribute the c3e to the k2 through the factor n minus p to get 
n c three e to the k t minus c three e to the k t times p. Maybe I should have put the n there, but it doesn't matter. This is better. You can get the p's on one side, everything else on the other. I want to add c three e to the k t times p to both sides. If I do, then I'll be able to factor it out on the left side. I did two steps there. First, I added C3, C3 e to the kt, p, two both sides, canceling on the right, getting that term on the left, and then I factored out the common factor of p on the left is 1 times p, that's where the 1 comes from, and then I also again have the c3 to the ktp that comes from multiplying these two things. Almost done, now just divide both sides by that. I could leave it like this and maybe replace the C3 with just a C. Or what I typically do with this example is I actually typically multiply the top and the bottom, well, think of it this way, divide the top and the bottom by C3 e to the KT. You don't have to do that, but it's got the benefit that it cancels two of the E's and just has one E involved ultimately. Um, and it also has the benefit that there's only one constant in one spot. So if I do that, I could write the function like that, where c4 is 1 over c3, but let, let's just call that a c. Do you see what I did there? Your algebra skills need to be good here. Where was it? Back here, I, well, somewhere where I erased, I multiplied the top and the bottom by, what was it, n? To get a simpler fraction. Here, I'm dividing the top and the bottom by c3 e to the kt, which cancels it out on the top, cancels it right there to the 1. I switched the order on the bottom, actually. Dividing that by c3 e to the kt gives 1 over c3 e to the negative kt, and then I call 1 over C3 just a C. That's probably the simplest form of the general solution. P equals this. There is your general solution. Represents infinitely many functions because C is arbitrary. Actually, this general solution is not completely ideal. Ideally, every general solution, general solutions can help you solve any initial value problem. However, this one can't. It misses one of the solutions. It misses a very simple solution. It misses p equals zero. There's no c you can pick since n is positive. There's no C you can pick that's going to make this equal to zero function. So this, I could call the general solution, but you should realize it's not completely ideal. You might wonder where did we go wrong in missing it. We didn't really go wrong. I mean, we were dividing the top and the bottom by, where, where do we have it? We divided by P and 1 minus P over N there. Maybe in that initial division step, we sort of lost the P equals zero solution, but you might think you we lose the other one at p equals n as well. But no, that one's, that one's in here. If c is 0, this is always equal to n. However, if you add the arbitrary initial condition and do a little algebra, you actually can get a formula that works no matter what the initial condition is, even if it's 0. Let me show you here. If I add this initial condition, p of 0 equals p sub 0, I want to solve for c in terms of p0, p 
In the simpler example, c was equal to p0. That doesn't always happen. It's not going to happen here. I want to solve this equation now for c. Multiply both sides by 1 plus c. Subtract p0 and then divide by p0. c can be written as n over, excuse me, n minus p0 over p0, which looks like it excludes the p0 equals 0 case again, and it does. However, if you now substitute this in here in place of the c, you can once again do a little algebra tricky stuff to get a formula that actually does work after simplification, even when p0 is 0. It's hard to organize your board work small chunk of board here. Put it up here. I can write P equals N over 1 plus this thing is the C N minus P0 over N or excuse me, over P0 E to the negative KT and then I can multiply the top and the bottom of this fraction by P0. Get N P0 over p0 plus, in parentheses, n minus p0 times e to the negative kt. And that works even when p0 is 0. Well, a lot of time here. We do have four more minutes, actually. We're going to go to 955 here. Um, but we are still low in time. Um, let's see what Mathematica gives for this differential equation. There's two main commands to solve differential equations in Mathematica symbolically. <coughs> There's something called desolve, which has always been there, I believe, since Mathematica started about 30 years ago. Desolve. And there's also a new command, desolve value, for Mathematica 10. This is Mathematica 10 and beyond, I'm sure, in 11 and 12, etc. I never knew about desolve value until somebody told me about it just a few weeks ago. Okay? It gives you the output in a nicer form, basically, is what desolve value does. <clears throat> I'll use them both. Type in the differential equation. We write differential equations in Leibniz notation, like dpdt. In Mathematica, you've got to use prime notation. P prime of T. You need double equal signs when you're solving equations in Mathematica. The right hand side is that, except we don't type it like that. We do not type it like this. <coughs> I'm going to use a little n here and not a capital N, because capital N is reserved symbol. Uh, you can't type it like that, it turns out. Even though this is an autonomous equation, no t's on the right hand side, p ultimately is a function of t, and so we do need to substitute, put the t's in here, on the right. This does not, uh, the equation is still autonomous. Essentially a way to think of this is the only way t appears on the right hand side is as the argument of p, p of t. There's no separate t's being multiplied or something. It's still an autonomous equation. Uh, next input is to tell what function to solve for. You actually can either put P or P of T here. And it turns out in some cases it's more useful to put P of T and in some cases it's more useful to put P. And I'll try to explain that later on. And then you put your independent variable. The input is the same for desolve value. The output is different though. The output for desolve is more complicated. It's something called a rule. Using that output is more difficult. The output for desolve value is an expression. The formula for the solution, essentially. The expression that defines the formula. <coughs> uh, this is a general solution, though it's not quite ideal because you got a this C is in the exponent, and it's it's not ideal actually for solving enough initial value problems. It's better in this case. 
to put in an arbitrary initial value problem, though if you do, you need curly braces. You need to put your differential equation inside a list along with your initial condition. And again, you need double equal signs. I put P0 there, and I'm not going to bother with the subscript. I could have put a specific number. I find it more useful to put P0. Don't worry about the warnings there. These formulas are nicer. Take a look at this one. Does it match this? Not, it doesn't look like it does. But it does if you multiply the top and the bottom of this by e to the positive kt, you'll get an e to the positive kt up there. You'll get an e to the positive kt times p0, just like that's on the Mathematica here. And the e to the negative kt and the e to the positive kt will cancel right there, leaving you with the n minus p0. This is the same function. Okay. So um, I only did a couple of autonomous examples today. If you're looking for a non-autonomous example with separation of variables, those old videos for chapter one do contain a couple, at least one non-autonomous example. Okay, if you want to look that up. It's about a 20-minute video. See you Friday.